This young woman is Michelle Lay, a 29-year-old nursing student. She had just told her colleagues she had to retrieve something from her car, and so she started her walk towards the parking lot. She could be seen leaving the hospital and entering the parking lot, but that's where the camera range falls short. Michelle is seen walking into the lot, but isn't seen walking out of it. It was a warm Californian evening on May 27, 2011. Sun had just set, but the dark became darker, and there was no sight of Michelle Lay or rest for the police, who were leaving no stone unturned in their search for her. Michelle Lay walked off on her own, so why did the police suspect that it was a case of abduction? Was Michelle Lay the target of a twisted plan? Michelle Hang Ti Lei was born on October 12, 1984, in Rancho Peñasquitos, a suburban community located in the northeastern part of San Diego City. She grew up in a loving family with her younger brother Michael, and they often visited their cousins. After graduating from Mount Carmel High School in 2002, she moved to the Bay Area to continue her studies. She attended San Jose State before transferring to San Francisco State University. Michelle always wanted to follow in her mother's footsteps and become a nurse practitioner, but her mother passed away due to cancer when Michelle was a teenager. Michelle was eventually enrolled in a nursing program at Samuel Merritt University in Oakland, California, where she could fulfill her dream. Although she'd moved away from her family, she remained close to them and was the center of their affection. She loved spending time with them and was known for her loving and caring nature at home. At work, she was valued for her sincerity and discipline. Michelle was expected to accomplish great things, but life had an unexpected turn waiting for her. May 27, 2011 was just another day at the Kaiser Permanente Medical Center in California, or so it seemed. Michelle Lay was working her usual shift until the end of the day when everything changed. At around 6.55 p.m., an hour before the end of her shift, Michelle informed her colleagues that she needed to retrieve something from her car, a white Honda SUV parked outside the hospital, and left the building. The CCTV recorded her walking to the lot and out of the camera range. This was the last time Michelle was seen. As two hours passed, at around 9 p.m., Michelle's instructor, Lori Rosa, noticed this long break and found it very unlike Michelle, who was a punctual student. Michelle had neither finished her shift nor signed out. Lori sensed something was off. She searched the maternity ward for Michelle, but couldn't find her. Lori sent a text and tried calling Michelle, but there was no answer. A nurse then told Lori that Michelle had gone to her car, but hadn't returned. Lori and a security guard went to the parking lot to look for Michelle, but neither Michelle nor her car were at the lot. After a couple of minutes, just as Lori was about to return, Michelle's car suddenly reappeared. Lori was relieved, thinking that Michelle had returned, but the relief was short-lived. Suddenly, the car reversed so swiftly that it nearly collided with another car before speeding away with a screeching sound right by the side of Lori, leaving her and the security guard stunned. Because of the darkness, she couldn't see the person driving, but she didn't wait another second to dial 911. It turned out Lori's suspicions weren't just a hunch. Michelle never reached her home after the car drove off from the parking lot, nor did she show up for an outing with friends that was planned for the next day. Following the instructor's report, the Hayward Police Department set off a diligent search for the missing Michelle. Police officers contacted Michelle's home and asked if they knew anything about her, but they didn't. Michelle was nowhere to be found. However, the same can't be said about her car. Around 9 a.m. after her disappearance, a white Honda SUV was found parked on Ponderosa Court, merely a half a mile from the medical center. The car was neatly parked and locked up. The contents inside it looked clean, and it didn't show any signs of struggle. The scene gave the impression that Michelle had parked it herself after rushing out of the medical center, and then later did her disappearing act. But investigators failed to see reason as to why Michelle would flee. Despite the apparent impression, the investigators were of the view that the discovery of the car was far from innocent. It, in fact, only deepened the mystery. In the initial hours, the police crafted a preliminary theory about Michelle's disappearance. Did Michelle leave by her own choice? Was her trip to retrieve something from her car a setup? Could she have been lured by a call? 
The investigator's primary conjecture was that someone familiar to Michelle might be connected to her disappearance. And a clue awaited just around the corner. As the news circulated among Michelle's extended family, friends, and colleagues, a sea of worried messages and calls buzzed Michelle's phone. All of them were unanswered. Something strange was about to unfold. One of these concerned messages got a reply from Michelle. It should have been great news, but the message was, well, eerie. I'm not missing. My phone has been crazy and it deleted everything. The oddity did not end there as several people received replies from Michelle's phone. Each message was emotionally detached and quite unlike the Michelle they knew. I had a flat tire. I had a bad night last night. All these messages killed my battery. Just taking it easy. I'm sick. As the police compared these messages, several of them were the same. They had been copied and pasted. And just as suddenly as the messages had started to pour in, they stopped at once. The location was from inside the hospital. The influx of strange messages had left Michelle's loved ones more petrified, and the police were baffled. But these messages had solidified their theory that someone familiar to Michelle was involved in her disappearance. The search for Michelle continued. The family traveled eight hours from their home to be in the city where Michelle had gone missing and to support the ongoing search. The family put up billboards and offered a reward for information about her whereabouts. But it seemed like Michelle had fallen off the face of the earth. Over the next four months, at least eight volunteer search efforts were undertaken, some organized by the Class Kids Foundation, a nonprofit organization based in Sausalito, California, devoted to assisting the recovery of missing people. A variety of missing persons organizations joined in the searches, but there's a parallel search that the investigators were involved in, the search for the suspect and the missing pieces of the fateful day. Police suspected from the beginning that Michelle's disappearance had something to do with a familiar face, someone whom she closely knew. Guided by that perspective, they began an investigation in an attempt at piecing together the potential events that transpired. There were loose ends that the investigators were turning their attention to. Beginning with the car, even though it seemed in a pristine state, there was no ruling out the possibility that it could contain what was invisible to the naked eye. The car was taken in for further investigation. The second investigative thread police followed were the CCTV cameras positioned in and around the parking lot. This examination aimed to uncover any overlooked clues or elusive details that could shed light on the mysterious circumstances. The final thread the investigators pursued was Michelle's relations and connections. They interviewed people about her, starting with her family. They wanted to know if she had any problems with anyone. That's when a particular name stood out, someone she'd recently fallen out with, her friend Giselle Esteban. Police went to have a quick chat with her, only to know she was looking for her too. We're here about Michelle Lee. Michelle. Oh God, what about her? She went missing last night from her work. Okay. And talking to um, her friends and such, uh, we understand that you guys had a tumultuous uh, relationship. A tumultuous relationship? She was my best friend who slept with my then fiance. Giselle Duwag Esteban was born on February 4, 1984, in the Union City of California. Later, she moved to San Diego and settled in the same neighborhood as Michelle when she was a kid. Michelle and Giselle went to the same high school and became close friends. When Giselle moved to college, Michelle followed her there to attend the same college and even lived in the same neighborhood. Their connected lives made them the closest of friends, navigating the journey of college and career goals together. Michelle had joined Giselle at the university in 2003. But back in 2002, Giselle had met a boy named Scott Marezigan, and they were both freshmen at San Francisco State University. Later, when Michelle joined, Giselle introduced Scott to her. Michelle and Scott took an immediate liking to each other and dated for a month. They later parted on amicable terms and remained close friends. However, Giselle's interest in Scott grew. A new chapter unfolded as Giselle and Scott began a relationship. Everything should have been a new beginning, but in this case, it wasn't. 
One day, Michelle sent a text to Scott informing him about an unwanted pregnancy that she was carrying. She decided to go for an abortion. The message was meant for Scott only as a friend, but instead of him, Giselle happened to see it and misread it. It wasn't Scott's baby. However, Giselle was convinced that it was. No number of explanations from Scott seemed to satisfy Giselle. Whether it was this new development or the bitterness that traveled down since the time Michelle and Scott dated, Michelle always remained a topic of conflict between Giselle and Scott since then. Among the three of them, the seed of hostility had been sown. Even after what had happened, it was a long-term relationship. And despite years of togetherness with Scott, Giselle grappled with insecurities in the relationship and the passage of time failed to bridge the emotional gap. She harbored frequent suspicions about Scott's loyalty, prompting her to routinely scrutinize his phone calls or second-guessing everything he said. Giselle especially wanted Scott to break off his friendship with Michelle. Despite the ups and downs and a brief breakup, Giselle gave birth to their daughter on October 31, 2005. However, three years later, in 2008, frequent disagreements between Giselle and Scott continued to occur. The bitterness fueled out of distrust and inability to alleviate these issues finally engulfed the relationship and Giselle and Scott broke up. They shared custody of their daughter for a year, but then one day in 2009, Giselle told Scott that she was moving in with a new boyfriend. Giselle took the baby back to San Diego, which spurred a legal custody battle between Scott and Giselle. Eventually, Scott won 80% of the custody and brought his daughter back to Northern California. It's important to note here that Michelle had kept her friendship alive with both Scott and Giselle even during these trying times. But after the breakup, Giselle gave Michelle an ultimatum to choose between Scott and her. As for Scott and Giselle, life remained complex as they kept their connections on and off, sliding back into intermittent physical relationships from time to time even after separation. It was only the beginning of more bitterness that was about to follow. In the meantime, a new development came out of the forensic examination of the car. Even though the police had not been successful in finding Michelle, they realized it may not be an alive Michelle that was at the other end of the search. This conclusion was drawn on the basis that the car contained the blood remains of Michelle Lay. Our primary concern was, is, and will always be to find Michelle and bring her home with us. At this point, she is still missing and we will fight to bring her home every day until we have her with our family again. Although the family found it hard to believe, the missing person case was now a homicide case. The second finding at the spot where her car was parked was more blood, a pool spending 10 and a half inches on the ground. Then inside the car, Michelle's nursing school ID was found kept there so as to be shown to the instructor when required. But was that so? The ID turned out to be strange indeed because eventually the instructor couldn't recognize it. And that's when the police decided to gather more information about it. And there it was, the truth. The ID didn't belong to Michelle. Instead, it was a stolen identification card reported just a few weeks earlier. Also, the investigators traced the cell phone right from the moment Michelle had walked out of the hospital into the parking lot. The cell phone had taken a long circle around the city of Hayward, got back into the hospital, only to move out again. The last location of the cell phone was into the remote areas of Alameda County, a wooded hilly area. However, the trail of oddity did not end there. An emergency ward nurse had come forward to narrate a strange call from Michelle the evening she went missing. Only about half an hour after Michelle had left the hospital, a call was made to the emergency ward, received by the mentioned nurse. The call was supposedly from Michelle Lay, and she wished that her instructor would know the reason for her absence. According to the supposed Michelle on the call, her father had suffered a heart attack and was taken into the hospital, but she wasn't aware of which one, so she was checking all the hospitals around and wouldn't be back to work as expected. Whoever made the call put a lot of head into it, but they missed a simple detail. The call was made to the emergency ward, but Michelle was posted in the maternity ward. And Michelle's father was in Vietnam, another detail that the real Michelle should have known. It seemed as though all the angles police had taken in were coming back with surprises. 
Hours of CCTV analysis showed a person walking into the hospital who, however, was not a very surprising name, Giselle Esteban. Over the next few months, Giselle Esteban was often called by the police, but not much came of it. You and Michelle were close friends, is that right? Consider her my sister. When was the last time that you and uh, Michelle actually spoke? I don't know. I remember seeing her at the meeting. Back in December? I think so, yeah. Yeah, I think it was in December. Okay. And what has happened since then? I don't know. How do you feel about the fact that she's missing? I wish you guys would find her already. And since you and Michelle used to be so close, what do you think is going on with her? I don't know. I don't know where she is anymore. But as far as you know, this is would be very unusual for her, right? To have uh, just gone missing? I don't know. I don't know Michelle anymore. I stopped knowing her a long time ago. Summer had given way to Autumn. The reward to bring information about Michelle's disappearance had been increased to $100,000. There were frequent volunteer searches that initially started with passion, but now began to wane. Michelle's family didn't find the pace of the police in dealing with the case satisfactory, and a private detective was hired. On the other hand, police were silently looking at the person they'd marked in red on their list, Giselle Esteban. But where was that one seal the deal link? Perhaps that vital link was hiding in the backdrop of Giselle Esteban and the interview she did with the investigators. I understand at, at one point you and Michelle were close friends, is that right? Considered her my sister. And then what happened? She made a mistake. Scott made a mistake. And that was that when you were with Scott? Or had you guys broken up? Or No, we were still together. We made the mistake twice. The strange ID found in the car was stolen from Michelle's nursing school. The CCTV cameras from the school were analyzed. A few days earlier, Giselle was found strolling around the school. With this piece of evidence, Giselle was no longer a blind trail. Her phone was traced using wireless tower activation from the night of the incident. Her phone was detected in the remote area of Alameda, where Michelle's phone switched off and later turned on again during the time everyone was getting replies from Michelle. Both the women's phones had traveled the same route. There were hordes of evidence indicating that Giselle Esteban knew something about Michelle Lay, but without the body, police couldn't prove it as a definite link to what had happened to Michelle. Only a few weeks down the line, something else was coming, an even deeper story of what Giselle really thought, not merely what she filtered out during the conversation with police. An inside story came from Scott when he woke up to find Michelle's cell phone in the back seat of his car. He immediately called the police. He was petrified and told the police he was being set up by someone. He alluded to Giselle being that someone. A backstory followed in Scott's conversation with police. It was 2009. After winning custody, Scott was living with his daughter in Northern California. Just a few months later, Giselle had managed to move back to live in the same area. One day, Giselle suggested to Scott and Michelle that since all three of them lived nearby, they should all meet to let go of the past and revive the friendship. Michelle was on board with the plan. Scott didn't find any harm in it either, and so the meeting took place. However, Giselle didn't end up liking her own idea the way she had anticipated. The meeting had stirred something in Giselle, and she disliked Michelle even more then. She blamed Michelle for the fact that her relationship with Scott ended, a hateful obsession was in the making. Giselle couldn't stop spewing hate against Michelle during conversations with Scott. During one such meetup at a coffee shop, Giselle threw a cup of coffee on Scott because he didn't seem to be entertaining the hypothetical idea of how it would be in case someone who hated Michelle disfigured her. The obsession began to escalate at such a rate that Scott started to save Giselle's hateful messages and threats. During the conversation with police, Scott showed some of these messages that Giselle had sent to Michelle and Scott in February of 2011. The message she'd sent to Michelle was, If you were really anybody's friend, mine or Scott's, you'd just f*** off and leave my family alone. But all you are is the poor who had nothing better to do and followed me to SF. That's all you ever will be, the whore. 
or who slept with other people's men and brothers because no one wanted you. You aren't my friend. You're always just a parasite. Giselle then sent a text message to both Scott and Michelle. You two really do deserve each other. I hope you get what you deserve. You're both pathetic. You with no dreams or goals and the other chasing after someone else's dreams because she has none of her own. You're both parrots. However, these were not the end of the hateful messages. Scott and Michelle would keep getting them the next day and the next for over a month. Just three days before Michelle disappeared, Scott had filed for a temporary restraining order against Giselle. He claimed she threatened him and his family. According to Scott, Giselle had broken into his home the same day Michelle had gone missing. Scott also turned in the audio clip that he recorded one day when Giselle and Scott were driving with their daughter in the back seat. I asked you, can we just be honest about Michelle because she's the one issue that I really, really am having a hard time dealing with. That's not what you said at all. Yes! Okay, we well then fine. Starting from now, we are going to be honest about Michelle. Do you understand me? Okay. Whether you sleep with her, whether you share food with her, whether you talk to her, you will be honest with me. Look at me! You will be honest with me regarding her. Otherwise, I will take your life and hers. Wow. And you can take that to the grave with you. Wow. Why? Because you lied about her so many times, it's hard to believe that you didn't sleep with her and lock her up. You deserve to die for your lies, as does she, and you will. If you do it again, this is your last and final warning. Why? Do you understand me? It's your last and final warning. The intent of the murder was there. Rage and revenge. But as for that definite link that the police have been chasing for so long, it was hidden in a new development. Giselle's DNA was found in Michelle's car. There was something on Giselle's shoes. The investigators took the shoes in, and as it turned out, the shoes were laced with Michelle's blood. With copious amounts of evidence, Giselle Esteban was arrested on September 7, 2011, around four months after Michelle's disappearance. But was Michelle ever found? The eighth search for Michelle ended in the finding of human remains in a remote canyon area on September 17, 2011. The body was so badly decomposed that even the gender couldn't be identified. Eventually, on September 19, 2011, 12 days after Giselle's arrest, the Alameda County Coroner's Office positively identified the discovered remains to be those of Michelle Lay. However, because of the state her body was found in, the autopsy couldn't establish how Michelle was killed. Oh, I heard they found Michelle's body. Can you comment on that? And I would, I just started shaking. I was, I was, I told him we haven't found her. But I knew that they did. When I got that call from the reporter, I knew. According to the police and later prosecution, Giselle's premeditated elaborate plan included stalking Michelle, keeping ahead of her schedule every day, calling Kaiser Permanente Hospital to know if she'd checked in, to arrange her number and the address from several mutual people. She even went to the Apple Store during the day of the crime to know how to reset an iPhone. Giselle had begun to track down Michelle and asked around for her address to a number of mutual friends from college. She finally followed her to the Kaiser facility in Hayward, attacked her in the parking lot, threw her body into Michelle's car, and drove her away from Hayward, ultimately out to the Pleasanton Sunol Valley Road area, and within sort of a makeshift grave, buried Michelle's body out there. We'll never know the cause of death of Michelle Lay because Giselle contended she was not guilty. She denied having done anything to Michelle and stuck by the story she gave during police interrogations earlier. However, in December 2011, Giselle Esteban was sentenced for 25 years to life in prison. She was found guilty of first-degree murder. She was two months pregnant when she planned the murder of her friend, Michelle Lay. Giselle's computer revealed she conducted around 300 internet searches for the name Michelle Lay. Other searches included how to follow someone without getting caught, how to find someone who doesn't want to be found, is there a certain chemical that can induce heart attacks without leaving a trace, how to induce a heart attack, where to buy potassium chloride. In 2012, she gave birth to her second daughter with Scott while being in prison. According to Scott's own admission, Michelle and Scott never dated after that one month during college and never had physical relations during or after their relationship. Michelle was merely a friend to Scott and to Giselle. 
jealousy is an ordinary emotion with a corrosive potential to surpass all the boundaries of ordinariness. In the case of Giselle, she had plunged into a dark psychological state that led to obsessive thoughts, intense feelings of betrayal, and a distorted sense of reality. In such instances, the toxic blend of jealousy and unchecked emotions can tragically propel someone towards committing unthinkable acts. But even after Giselle harbored and spewed hate, Michelle didn't see what was coming for her, and Scott failed to grasp the severity of Giselle's day-to-day -day threats and obsession. On the other hand, the children of Scott and Giselle are left destined to grow up with a mother behind bars. In the intricate and psychotic outbreak of emotions, Giselle's jealousy emerged as a powerful adversary. Toxic relationships are made and maintained all the time with or around us, and Scott exhibited the typical stages of a victim in an abusive dynamic, falling in and out of the relationship. But perhaps there were signs left unread by Scott that could have prompted him to alert the authorities and potentially avert the tragic outcome. Have you ever been in a toxic relationship as tumultuous as the one discussed here? And why do you think Scott and Michelle might have missed these warning signs despite years of togetherness with Giselle? Let us know in the comments section below. And if you found today's video interesting, please consider subscribing to our channel, hit that like button, and share our videos. Also, if you have any crime story that you'd like us to cover, leave us a message in the comments section below.